Welcome to Where Parents Talk TV. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest is Heather McTaggart. She is a mother of four, director of Unschooling School, a nonprofit. She's also the founder and executive director of Classroom Connections and co-author of a book called Overschooled But Undereducated. Thanks for joining us, Heather. Very nice to be here. Now, your organization, Unschooling School, conducted a national survey in Canada in January of 2021. More than 860 parents of children under 18 were surveyed. Before we get into the results of the survey, could you tell us what was the impetus for this survey? We wanted to find out whether our feeling as, as this group that has been has come together and worked on an unschooling school, um, that our feeling that parents were dissatisfied about certain aspects of education were true. That um, we felt that a lot of people understand that interests comes or that learning comes by interest. And that if you let kids learn what they're interested in, they're of course going to learn more. So we knew that as a group, but we thought we should make sure that you know, people out there generally believe that, and that's that's what that's why we did the survey. Tell us what the top three key findings were. Well, they were actually even more exciting than we, than we anticipated. Um, Seventy-three percent of parents felt kids at school should be able to learn the subjects they're interested in, should be able to follow their passions and learn about those things. Um, Sixty-seven uh, percent felt that we need a school reset as in it's time, you know, during the pandemic and after the pandemic to really rethink how we structure school. And the other one that I thought was kind of interesting was 57% of parents would have liked to have been able to follow their own passions when they were at school. There's so much to dig into there. And I can see how, you know, conducting a survey like that and getting those results is, is exciting because those are all really meaty topics. Let me ask you this, though, as a mother of four who presumably has experienced some of these feelings over time, um, what was your take on, on what surprised you the most among these findings? Um, what I find as as somebody who, you know, was uh, considered brilliant in kindergarten and uh, they told my parents, oh, she should be skipping to grade two. Then in grade two, they found out, no, nope, this child is stupid. Um, there's something really wrong with her and she's not doing anything she's supposed to be doing. And that kind of persisted through most of my K to 12 uh, life until university where I got straight A's. Um, my take on it is because I was interested and that's, and I was more in control of it. And then when I had kids, my first daughter just sailed along, learned to read magically by herself at the age of three or four. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe the school system is, is fine. And uh, it was just me. And then my next daughter came along and a whole different story. None of it made sense to her. She just, it was like oil and water. And um, what I found when I talked to parents about it is if they've had one of those two experiences, they get it. So if school is either some degree of horrific for them, they understand, wow, we really need to change what we're doing. Or if they sailed through and did really well, or you know, we're fine, and then they suddenly have a child that is, they think, geez, this is a great kid. This kid's smart in so many ways. They're just either hating school or failing school or so bored because they already know it all, and yet they're forced to do the same thing of everybody else. So it's those people that we, we find are saying, yeah, let's do something. So I was pleased to see that it's even a broader range of people. Let me ask you, did the pandemic, in your opinion, impact these findings? And if so, in what specific ways would you say that happened? I would say definitely yes. Um, we hold open oh, Zooms on Tuesday. So uh, um, on unschoolingschool.com, there's a link to our Zooms and same with, uh, on our Facebook group. And we often had subjects, but parents can, and you know, educators can just join. And we are hearing so many things, uh, particularly about uh, distance education and parents shock that a six-year-old is, is expected to sit for six hours or five hours in front of a screen and just listen to a teacher. Um, parents of older kids who are now seeing in very, on very, very close range, what the kids are doing. And thinking, this is ridiculous. Why are they memorizing this when all they need to do is take out their phone uh, and speak to it? And the answer is right there. 
you know, why aren't they doing other things? And there's a, there's a lot of that going on. You talk about one of the survey findings, which is 67% of parents surveyed saying that a school reset is in order. In an ideal world, having been in this space for uh, 20 odd years as you have, what does a school reset look like to you? Thank you so much for asking me that question. It is a great question. What it looks like is almost a time reset. School as we know it is only about 150 years old. Before that, we trusted biology. We are naturally born to learn. We are the preeminent species, not because we are the greatest teaching species, but because we are the greatest learning species. So we have things that are in us. Like we don't teach babies to talk. All babies need to talk is to be around people talking. Doesn't matter what ethnicity that baby is, it will learn the language of whoever's around. And we know for exact, you know, for example, kids in Africa generally speak three, four, five, sometimes six languages because they're always around those languages. But if you don't hear language before the age of seven, you may never speak. And that's why learning, learning a new language after seven, you actually have to learn it. Whereas babies are absorbing it almost by osmosis. So we have so many of those things built into us as human beings. And what we need as a perfect learning environment is, is a rich, supportive environment with loving, caring people and all the tools of the culture that kids need to play with. So computers and art equipment and science equipment and phys ed stuff and all the things you normally find in a school. But instead of the adults being in control and making this predetermined decision about what kids need to know, despite the fact that we have no idea what the future will really look like, um, instead of going by that preset curriculum, let kids just explore and do and figure it out. Mostly, especially when they're little, through play. And then as they get older, through playing with ideas. So it would look more like a community center than a school or a library, or maybe a combination school, uh, community center and library. So it's, I find it so interesting because, I mean, we live in the knowledge economy, right? So the technology that kids are exposed to, you know, social media, AI, it's a long list of things now that are contributing to, to knowledge being everywhere and not necessarily residing in a school. In your opinion, is unschooling an idea whose time has now come? Yes. <laughs> Um, I think the things that you're pointing out about technology and, and information being everywhere can make the whole idea much easier for people to grasp. Because before there were a few people with lots of the information. And so those few neat people needed to pass it to the masses who didn't have it. That is so not the case anymore. We also know so much more about how the brain works because we can look in, inside brains and watch them learn through things like functional neurons. So the brain science would absolutely say the brain looks like a jungle and it makes connections, you know, out of interest and out of repetition. And there's a, a guy named Gerard Inman, who's a, who's a scientist who coined the term um, uh, neural Darwinism. And he would say that, you know, the brain is jungle-like and perhaps the best learning environment is jungle-like. So there's all kinds of, of input and people can go and latch on to the things that spark them, that interest them. And since we now know that information is readily available and out there, we don't need the same kind of rote or rigid structure to allow kids to be exposed to everything. They will naturally just get exposed by hanging around with people of different ages, for example and friends and watching somebody do something say that's cool i wonder how i how i do that well they can they can watch a youtube first before they go in and join it if they feel it. so what do you say then to parents who may listen to this and say you know rigor schedule routine regimen all of these things are cornerstones of the way the current education system is set up and as you point out has been the case for 150 years the idea of not having that anymore which is spark fear in, in, in all kinds of parents and all kinds of, of teachers. How do you respond to that? First thing I'd say is trust biology. Trust that we were created to learn, that we have continued to create ourselves and to create future generations to learn. 
um, that that is inborn in kids. That, um, of course, to become a doctor, to become a lawyer, um, to become an electrician, there's a huge amount of rigor and learning very specific things that have right and wrong answers. And, and there's, there's a time for teaching and classes on those things. So we're not saying that that should all disappear, but what we are saying is that that needs to be at the child's choice. There needs to be consent. What we know about the brain is that it can absorb something and spit it back on a test without any interest, but it'll not be there next month because for, for those the neural connections to really happen, there, there needs to be interest. So we have this false idea that a system full of structure and rigor and high stakes testing and um, all of the things that, you know, age segregation, like think about age segregation, like what, what is that for? Convenience of the system. It's certainly not natural to kids and it's certainly not the best way for them to go out, the, you know, to go about their lives. When was the last time you were in a group and there were only 32 year olds in that group and you could only hang out with them? I mean, it just, it's, it doesn't really make sense. So the, the data and the research is really far more on the side of this idea uh, that we should unschool our schools or we should promote and create places for what's called self-directed education. And if that seems like crazy to you, then my idea is go to unschoolingschool.com, look under the resource tab and scroll down the bed and you'll see this crash course. And it's a crash course of fairly short videos on the power of self-directed education, which includes some of the science behind it. And I think I would, it would be pretty hard for somebody to watch, you know, spend maybe overall two hours watching those videos and not come away going, ah, okay, yeah. There's a lot of structures in the system that we really don't need. So on that note, let me ask you this, um, you know, student-driven learning versus teacher-imposed learning and parent-enforced learning, those are just completely diametrically opposed concepts. And in the time you've been in this space, what kind of feedback in general have you gotten from people who you have presented this idea to and this approach and concept to who were firmly on the other side? In other, way, in other words, you know, holding the status quo as it, as it were. What kind of feedback have you gotten from those individuals? You know, it varies. There are people that will just shut right down. They're like, you're out of your mind. And, um, you know, the way it is, is the way it needs to stay. Um, I'll tell you, there are plenty of teachers who say, we know. And we would really love to be doing things a different way, but this is the way the system is structured. And, and that is very true. And there are teachers, we, we sometimes refer to them as responsible subversives, who, you know, keep the lights on and do the things, but also behind the classroom door, you know, help their, help their students to explore on their own and investigate things that they're truly passionate about. And would love a system that is less rigid, less structured, more or entirely self-directed because they can see this is what, you know, this is where kids spark. So, you know, I would still invite, and I still get into, you know, deep discussions with parents and, and it's, it's not just parents, but it's normally people that say the system worked for me. And, and that's great. And I'm glad it did. Um, and even if the structure hadn't been there and you're a person that really likes structure and likes things to proceed in a certain way, if you're in a self-directed environment, you can create that for yourself. You can make your own timetable, you can do it your own way and you can set up that structure and you can search out places or even let's say, you know, in a, a school where some of the kids were self-directed, we call it being a free learner. And, and part of what we're advocating for is that uh, kids and parents and families should be able to choose, my child is designated a free learner. And they're going to select things at their school environment that they're gonna participate in and they're gonna opt out of other things. So having classes running and still being there, kids can still go and do those classes. They can still have that structure when they, when they, when they want to. And school environments, um, where this has been happening, uh, and this sort of the main one in North America is called the Sudbury Valley School, just outside Boston, Massachusetts, and it's over 50 years old. 
And it's just how it runs. Kids from four to 19 go there and they do what they want every day, all day long. And a higher number than the average, over 80% go on to higher education. And some kids come there and they create their own timetable. And they say to their friends, hey, this is, it's, it's time for this, this, and this. Do you want to join? And some of the kids join and some of them don't. So it doesn't mean you can't have structure. It just means, you know, we really think it's incredibly counter um, intuitive and we know for sure damaging to force kids to do things that they really don't want to do. On that note, what advice could you offer for parents who maybe are now exposed to how their kids are learning in ways that they never were prior as a result of the pandemic, as a result of distance learning, virtual learning, et cetera, about how they can support their child's learning? And I'm thinking specifically about parents who have children um, within the ages of 15 to sort of 19, 20, when, you know, when um, post-secondary considerations are on the table, career options are being considered, what advice could you offer uh, in terms of strategies for those parents in that, in that grouping? Well, the first thing is to get, your, get yourself educated, to understand, learn something about learning, learn something about the brain. Um, as I said, we've got tons of resources on the on school.com website and those resources lead to other places. So this is a huge world. And after you kind of put your toe in, you'll think to yourself, how did I not know this? How did I not know there are probably 500 self-directed schools around the world and I've never even heard of one. Um, so I think that's the first step. The second and if you already know some of these things, then maybe you don't need to do that one first. But the second is to step back, is to particularly this year, if you can, you can get your head around it. Give your kids a gap here for the rest of this year. I mean, this is not a good use of time. Most of what's going on, if your kids are loving it, great. Like, they're miserable. Say to them, what else would you rather be doing if you didn't have to do this? And have a conversation about what that might be. You know, and you might be surprised that they want to take, go to Khan Academy and learn physics because that's what they're really passionate about. Or maybe they'd like to do an art project. Maybe they'd like to build your garage over again. Um, or maybe they'd like to spend all day gaming. And you know what? We now know about the brain. That's actually okay. And believe me, I was not one of those mothers. <laughs> when my kids were little, I tried to keep them far away from video games. But we now know it actually makes neural, really good neural connections and uh, is good for hand-eye coordination, is actually very social. Um, and yeah, the odd person becomes addicted, but it's, it's not very common or it's not that common. So, you know, if they wanna spend all day long creating games and great gaming communities, let them do that. You know, the, the most, um, you know, for most of civilized, and I use that word very cautiously, uh, uh, for most of civilized time, when we've had trades and very specific jobs, the way people learned them was through apprenticeship. And, and that's a lot about uh, what John Abbott and I talked about in Overschooled and Undereducated, which is that the, the real model of, of education is play for little kids and apprenticeship as kids be, start being interested in doing something specific, is trying it out, is learning through a math or a master. So we could say volunteering, um, you know, a part-time job, uh, starting your own business. I mean, so many of those things you can now do online. And so I would say, you know, let kids use their time more usefully um, right now because this idea of behind, it's a very false idea. There is no such thing as behind. Our kids are going to live likely over 100. Behind what? And the other mistake is thinking learning loss. There is no such thing. If you're breathing, you're learning. That's just how it works. So my advice is learn yourself and try to let go. Always easier said than done the second part of that, of that, uh, of that advice. But you started by talking about, you know, two of your children and sort of their uh, very different journeys. I'm wondering, you know, knowing what you know now, educated as you are in this topic, is there anything you would have done differently or were they, you know, younger now, what would you be looking at for them? Um, I would have done everything differently. Um, not in terms of how I loved them and supported them, encouraged them, 
um, and was there for them, but in terms of how I schooled them. So, you know, my line, particularly to my second daughter who was miserable was, look, it's not you, it's them. School stinks, but it's the game and it's the only game in town. I'm trying to change it. So from that, for right now, just play the game and do the best you can. And, you know, I remember this one conversation when she was about nine years old and she broke out crying and she said, but it makes me feel so bad. And I said, well, that's why mommy's trying to change it. And she looked at me and she goes, hurry up. Hmm. It was heartbreaking. So if I'd known what I knew now, if I, for example, visited the Sudbury Valley School the way I got to do, you know, two years ago, I would have unschooled at home. You know, I would have tried to find other parents who understood this and let kids hang out and play all day long. Because play, play is child's work. That is what they are supposed to be doing. Um, and I would have, you know, said, well, let's dip in and out of school when it makes sense. You know, stay, stay registered, do the classes you want. Don't do the classes you don't want. And that's, that's really what we're saying with unschooling school is we've got these great resources. Let's just use them differently. It should all get to be free. You know, we in uh, 89, we decided that children were human and the Charter of Rights and uh, the Charter of Rights applies to kids. I'm not sure what they were before 1989, but we did decide they were human then. So one of the most basic human rights is to make choices about what you do. So, you know, it's more than time that we let that apply to kids. And, and you know, so I, I think I, I but if I'd thought of this idea, I would have just let my kids do it now, even if they were the only one. And I'll tell you, my middle daughter, she would have done it. <laughs> she, and I would have done it. If I'd thought of this when I was eight, man, I would have just said, no, I'm doing this, but I don't like any of that, so I'm going home. And it's, you know, it has to be done nicely, of course. And we've got a lot of kind of uh, handouts and templates and structure on the website that could help parents and could help educators, you know, do this in a in a respectful way, because we don't want to, you know, turn the school upside down. Um, although, you know, eventually it, it may get quite turned around. But in the meantime, as people say, yep, I'm going to be a free learner. Here's my form. Here's what I'm going to, how I'm going to spend my time. Here's how I'd like to use the resources of the school. Let's have a, a sit down and figure that out. You know, once we're back into regular, uh, regular schooling after the pandemic. Um, you know, that's that's what I would have done if I figured that out when I was when my kids were little. Last question for you. Um, the survey results uh, are going to be analyzed by all kinds of people in, in different ways, certainly. What is your hope of, for this survey moving forward? What do you hope it will yield? Well, I think what I hope is that it, it has people say, wow, okay, I'm not the only one that thinks that way. Um, we need to be doing things differently. If, if most of us agree that kids should get to follow their passions and learn things that they are interested about, why are they spending so much time going through drudgery that they can't stand? Are they really getting out of anything out of them? And I, and I defy any, anybody who's 40 years old to look at something they hated at school and that they still remember. For example, could you draw a periodic table? No, I could not. For sure, I could not. I remember the first thing about it. Nor do I need to. <laughs> but now, if I want to find out, I can I can Google it pretty quickly. Just a lot of food for thought for parents who watch this interview. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's great to be here.